Ismail Abad. I want to thank everyone who, uh, who attended today the uh, town hall, our first town hall meeting. Today marks the uh, first anniversary of, uh, of opening this place. We opened this place uh, uh, formally on February 18th. We had opened it a week or two prior as a soft launch where we just kind of came in and practiced uh, running it. And then we opened it formally. It was a Jumu'ah, it was February 18th. And now we're a year later. And uh, thank you for attending and participating and listening to us explain what we've done and what we hope to do. And thank you for your comments and questions. If you feel like you wanted to comment or you had a question or you had some feedback that you didn't get the chance to offer, um, please uh, reach out to us as uh, board members and uh, we have an email. We are usually quite responsive, so if you just send it to us, we're happy to, uh, to listen to it. And um, we take feedback quite seriously within this group and uh, we're happy to, to listen to you. If you have something to say, if you think that we're doing something well, we would like to hear you praise us. <laughs> and if you think we're doing something not well, Like our, like our audio system, for example, then feel free, <laughs> feel free to criticize us. And if there's something that should be happening that's not, that you would like to point out, do that as well. Um, we're happy to hear. I, I encourage people, this place is based on empowerment. I encourage people that if they have an idea, that you champion it and hold us accountable if we don't help you or if we don't support you, if we don't allow you to take steps forward. Because um, the number of ideas in the community, unfortunately, are much higher than the number of people who are willing to do anything about them. <laughs> so that's maybe why we have to kind of get a little bit of a, of a balance in terms of, uh, of numbers. We need the numbers of ideas to match the number of people who are willing to actually do things. Uh, and uh, so if you have an idea, you want to get something done, you can share it with us and we will try and help you champion it. And if we have the ability to champion it ourselves, we will as well. All right. So today, inshallah, I'm going to uh, conclude the, uh, the, ta the, the Battle of Khaybar, which is we started, I think, well, technically, we started it three, two weeks ago, but I talked about the bulk of it last week. We haven't gone through the, uh, the kind of the fun part of the story yet, so you get to enjoy that with me today, inshallah ta'ala. Um, a quick, a very quick recap. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. You've heard this before, but just a kind of quick reminder if this is the first time you've attended this. This is, what, what year is this, roughly speaking? What year? Just blurt it out. What year is this, roughly speaking? Seventh. Seventh of the Hijrah of the Prophet, alayhi so Never forget to point out what seventh. Because there are seven of his prophecy, which is the time of Medina, and there are seven of his hijrah, alayhi salatu wasalam. So we're close to the end of his story, alayhi salatu wasalam. It always breaks my heart when I come close to the end of it, even though I've done this maybe eight times. But it's such a hard story to tell when you come to the end of it. And this is the seventh year of his hijrah, alayhi salatu wasalam. He passes away right at the beginning, right early 11th year. So we'll have a few more years to actually uh, uh, share with you. But right after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, spread his wings, and he started corresponding with kings, uh, around, uh, around the region, and, and he started actually uh, building treaties with people around him, alayhi salam, he actually really started to open up uh, the country, like the, the Muslim country, the Medina, uh, became, became a recognized national uh, 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 country that had its uh, army and it had its uh, government. It didn't have that prior to Hudaybiyah. Hudaybiyah recognized Muslims and Islam as a, as a country that had its own uh, independence and, and autonomy. So the Prophet Sallallahu became very interested in, uh, in establishing that. So once he sent out his messengers and Al-Harith bin Umayr al-Azzi was killed by the king of Ghassasina, the Prophet Sallallahu moved an army to defend the, yani, to avenge the, the brother who was killed and the Ghazwa of Mu'ta occurred and I told that a number of weeks ago. And then when, the, when they came back, the Prophet ﷺ became more interested in neutralizing any threats that, or any places where conspiracy was occurring. And Khaybar had become the center of conspiracy. Quraysh had lost its fuel. Quraysh didn't have much to offer anymore. Mecca was no longer a threat. The Prophet ﷺ's eyes are on Mecca. But in order for him to reclaim the Holy Land, in order for him to go back and actually do that, he requires to get, he has to get rid of other threats that exist in the land. And Khaybar was becoming a real problem. So the Prophet ﷺ attempted once and twice and three times to actually sign a treaty of peace with them. And they refused. And they continued to conspire. They actually were paying people, were paying mercenaries to build armies. And he had to go neutralize that. It was becoming a headache. So the Prophet ﷺ marched with 1,400 people towards a place that had never been historically conquered by anyone. No army had ever been able to actually get through the walls of these eight castles with 40,000 trees on the inside and 10,000 warriors and enough food to go beyond a year. The Muslims went with 1,400 people and enough food for maybe 20 days. Maybe. Not, not even. But he went to because his concept was, and I've talked about this last time, but I want to keep it with you because it's a gem that I think is worthy of, of kind of uh, contemplating. 
the Prophet ﷺ would exhaust all of his resources, do his best, and go for it. He wouldn't make excuses. He wouldn't say, well, I'm not, we're not strong enough, or it's not, it's not balanced, it's not fair. Is this all you've got? Yes, I'm doing everything I can. Then go for it. If, this is, if you're putting in your full 100% effort, then there's nothing for you to worry about. Sleep well at night and keep on going towards your goal if you're giving it your all. And the Prophet ﷺ gave it his all all the time, and he had taught the Sahaba to do the same. So it's marching towards eight, an eight castle wall with 40,000 40, trees and 10,000 warriors and enough food for a year with 1,400 people that barely could make it for two weeks wasn't something that he shied away from, alayhi salatu wasalam. He wasn't afraid, didn't say no, because that's all he had. He gave it everything, he brought everything he could and he went forward and that's what we should do. In your life, always, you're not required to give more than your 100%. You're required to exhaust your resources, to plan appropriately, to you, to, to make, you, have to, you have to make sure that you've done everything within your ability to ensure success. But once you've done that, that's it. You are not responsible for the outcomes. Go for what you know is the right thing. He always did that, alayhi salatu wasalam, and that's why, you know, that's why he was successful. Because he understood how to do it. And I gave you examples of how the Prophet, alayhi salam, even had intelligence sweeping the land. So he knew. That most likely, Ghatafan was paid off by Khaybar and they're going to come and try and, and, and destroy him from behind. They're going to put him in a position where in front of him was Khaybar and behind him was Ghatafan. So he knew that. He, he didn't walk naively into a situation where he had no understanding. No, no. He knew that was probably going to be the case. So he had Talha and Zubair where they were ready. They were ready to start rumors to scare Ghatafan off and go back to protect, to protect their own tribe. And they did that successfully, which allowed the Prophet ﷺ enough time to, to hold the siege. So they held the siege around the, uh, the walls for 15 nights. Nothing happened. They could not get through. They could not conquer anything. It didn't work at all. These are huge things, eh? Look at the size of this. This is still there. You can go, if you go, go to Saudi Arabia, you can actually go look, see these things. These were huge. These castles were, 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 were humongous. They were, until this day, they're monumental. And they exist in a part of the world that you wouldn't think has these castles. These are not, you know, the, these stories aren't from Lord of the Rings. This is actually, this is stuff that actually exists uh, in the world. Today you can go see that and, 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 uh, and, and, and imagine maybe what they had to go through. It's not working anymore. Can you, someone do something for me? The team, just, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not taking anymore. So the Prophet, salam, after 15 nights, he would develop periodically, salam, some migraines. After Uhud, after falling into the hole, and he bled out a lot, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he hurt himself, he would have migraines every once in a while. He would require like a night where he would be in a lot of pain, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he would kind of be out of commission maybe for a few hours. So he had a migraine that night, and it wasn't working out. So he said, so he started to give the, the, the banner to different sahaba. So he gave it to Abu Bakr, and told him, Staftih, meaning go, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you the ability to, to, to conquer the wall or get, get, get through, and that didn't work out. Keep on going here. I told all these stories last time, so I won't uh, go back. Okay, here, perfect. So he gave it to Omar, it didn't work, gave it to Uthman, it didn't work. So the night that he had the migraines, he said, okay, tomorrow I'm going to give the, uh, the banner. Uh, so, I'm going to give it to someone who loves Allah and his prophet, and Allah and his prophet love him back. He said, I'm going to do it tomorrow at Fajr. He comes to pray Fajr والسلام, that morning, the masjid was packed. Everyone was there. Even people who had never led an army in their entire lives, even people who didn't even know exactly how to do it, they showed up in full armor, hoping that maybe the Prophet والسلام, meant them because they wanted not the, the leadership, no, they wanted the description he gave. They weren't interested in leading the issue. They wanted what he just said. He, he, the Prophet والسلام, made testimony. He testified saying that the person who's going to carry it is someone who both he loves Allah and his Prophet, and his Prophet and Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Prophet love him. So they wanted that. So everyone was there. After Salat al Fajr, everyone's walking around, kind of, you know, I need to pick up something, Ya Rasulullah, from here, kind of flexing a little bit on them, hoping that maybe the Prophet ﷺ picks them. So people are doing all that. So the Prophet ﷺ is smiling, he sees it all. He's happy that people have that uh, yeah, any, uh, in, uh, intention and initiative. Where's Ali? Ya Rasulullah, عنده رمد. No, no, he's sick. Yes, Pinkai. No, no, forget about him. Someone else. Someone else, he's sick. He's sick. No, no, no just move on. He's not, he's not doing well. He bring him to me. He would, ha he would have uh, periodically have a problem with his eye. And he would have to stay in. in. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, 
ثم أخذ يمسح على عيني and then he started to, to wipe over my eye يقرأ من كلام الله سبحانه وتعالى ويرقيني he began to recite the book of Allah سبحانه وتعالى he performed the ruqya يقول فما رفع يعني يده عن عيني إلا ونسيت في أي عيني كان الرمد once he took his hand off I couldn't remember after that till this day I don't remember which of my two eyes would get ill like I can't remember anymore because I see I can I can see I can see perfectly in both يقول فكنت أتمنى لو كان الرمد في عيني حتى يمسح على حتى يمسح علي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فيطيل I was I started to wish I had ramad in both my eyes so the Prophet عليه الصلاة would spend a little bit more time wiping over my eyes and reciting Quran for me صلى الله عليه وصحبه وسلم so the Prophet عليه الصلاة said قم يا علي get up قال خذ الراية take the banner واذهب واستفتح ولا تلتفت go and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you success and do not turn back. So Ali radiallahu anhu took the banner and he started to move forward. And then he remembered something. He wanted, he wanted to ask a question. So he remembered the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam before he asked the question, told him not to turn back. So Ali walked backwards because he didn't want to, he told the Prophet, the Prophet alayhi salatu told him don't turn back. So he didn't want to turn back and, 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 and disobey the Prophet. So he walked backwards. And he came back, فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ قَالَ يَا عَلِي مَا أَعَادَكْ Why are you back? فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَا أُقَاتِلُهُمْ Why do I fight them? Like what am I telling them? What is the point of all this? What, do, what is the, my communication with the person on the wall? What do I tell them? فَقَالَ أُدْعُهُمْ إِلَى شَهَادَتِي لَأَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Call them. To the belief in لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله فلا أن يهدي الله بك يا علي رجلا خير لك من حمر النعم He told him because يا علي if Allah guides one person through your effort one person it's better for you than owning all of the wealth in the world This to me and this hadith is in the Sahihain by the way and this to me tells me it, 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 it explains very clearly the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام's intentions Ali Sallallahu was not in this for the blood or the money or the uh, conquering of any part of the world. His problem, Ali Sallallahu was that he did not have the right or the safety to speak about Islam openly, which is exactly what we have today, by the way. His problem is he didn't have that. He wasn't able to talk about Islam to people and explain it without fearing for his life, without fearing for being persecuted or killed because of, of, of certain people who are conspiring against them, trying to annihilate them. His fight with people was for the right of free speech, to speak freely, and a right of, for, for freedom of religion, to believe in whatever you want. That's what he was fighting for, alayhi salatu wasalam. This is so important, because sometimes we study his story and we don't understand that piece. The Prophet, alayhi salatu had no interest in forcing anybody to believe in anything. If you force someone to believe in something, what do you create? you create something called a munafiq. We have no interest in having more of them. Either you believe, so you're a Muslim, or you don't. To force you to believe in something only creates nifaq, only creates hypocrisy. Someone who doesn't really believe, but is forced to say that they do. So, and that's the biggest. Humul adu'u fahdarhum. That's what the Quran says. They are the enemy. They're the problem. Allahu anna yu'fakun. So the Prophet ﷺ had no interest in forcing anybody. But he wanted the right to be Muslim. And he wanted the right to speak about Islam to others, and people to have the right to accept or not accept. So when he's going for Khaybar, his goal is not to annihilate, or to destroy, or to conquer. His goal is to, got, is to get, his, get that right, and maybe in the process, if he can perform da'wah, then that would be even better. If they accept Islam, that's his goal. If they can accept Islam, khalas, perfect. So he told Ali, قَاتِلْهُمْ عَلَىٰ شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهُ فَلَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمُرِ النَّعْمِ It's better for you if Allah grants guidance to one person through you. It's better than you for everything, than anything in the world. So Ali رضي الله عنه understood that. قال فَإِنْ رَفَضُوا If they say no, قال تُقَاتِلُهُمْ Then you fight them. If they refuse this, if they refuse to accept this, then you fight them. Because they've conspired so many times in the, in the past. So رضي الله سيدنا علي رضي الله عنه would go and we'd march, he would take the army and he would start marching towards the wall. Obviously they're doing this under their shields because of the archers on the, on the, uh, on the walls of the castle. He comes close to the door and he bangs on the door رضي الله عنه. I love this story because سيدنا علي رضي الله عنه is a very specific, it's a very, a very specific figure. Obviously some people have completely you know, misused his legacy. But in general, generally speaking, سيدنا علي for us as, as Muslims is someone who's very special. 
He's, he's someone who accepted Islam very early. He was 10 years old when he did this, very young. He's been with the Prophet every single step of the way. He has never missed a beat with him. At this point, he's in his late 20s, strapping young lad. He goes, he knocks on the door hard. The Sahaba who are, watching, who are narrating this story tells us the door was shook to the point where we thought maybe we don't need to ask them anything because if he just hits on the door a little bit more, he'll just fall in. He hit on the door hard so the people actually respond. My name is Ali Abi Talib. On the other side, the person said, Someone said, You are doomed, Wallah. Not to them, speaking to each other. We have within our book that no one will conquer this uh, castle except someone called Ali. And they start, and then the ru'b, the fear begins in the hearts of the people on the other side. They become scared. They become scared. This is the, this is the tool Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's fear, fear. They become scared, they panic. The leaders are like, no, 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 we're fine. We can, it's, it's been 15 days and they're starving. Remember the story of Abdullah bin Maghfal? He finds a little piece of meat, he wants to eat it on his own, the Prophet looks at him. He understands the, the story and he goes and he divides it amongst people because people are starving. On the other side, no, they're having dinners and banquets every night, no problem, a lot of food there. So just don't worry, they cannot conquer this wall. If you don't weaken the defenses in front of the door, we'll be fine. But people panicked. Panic occurred and the soldiers who were holding the fort, holding the wall, holding the, uh, the door, would actually retreat back to their homes out of fear. And the Muslims would make it through the door. Before they did this, I'm going to take you a step back because I think this is, I like telling this story, it's fun. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, after he knocked on the door, they said that, he said, Arsilu ilayya man yunaziluni, send me somebody. You know how, you ever heard of duels? Anciently, wars would always begin with duels. It would be a duel. Two warriors from each army would fight. And the, sometimes, sometimes, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the result of the fight would actually uh, end the war, meaning if one person, if, if, the, if this warrior beat that warrior, then there would be no reason for a war. That, uh, that army would just retreat. And sometimes it would just be for morale, just for people to feel better. So, so they, he asked for, for someone to be sent out for a duel. So they send out a man, his name is Marhab. And he comes out and he's saying poetry. He'll say, He starts saying poetry. I am his Marhab and I do. This guy was around two and something meters. He was over two meters tall. Sayyidina Ali was, a, was shorter, maybe as short as I am, maybe, maybe a little shorter. Sayyidina Ali was very, was stocky, radiallahu anhu. He was, he was a thick gentleman, he was bold, and he was extremely, they would say that, this is what they say about Sayyidina Ali. If he held you by your arm, you would, wouldn't be able to breathe anymore. If he took you by the arm, if he held you by your arms, you would find it difficult to breathe. He was a very, very strong gentleman. But he was not tall. He was a short gentleman, a bit stocky. Marhab comes out, he's a, he's a, yeah, you need two Ali's on top of each other to be as, as tall as Marhab was. So those Muslims are looking behind and they're like, La ilaha illallah. Who is, who is this? What is this giant that has emerged from the... Um, uh, but he's saying in this poetry, Khaybar knows my name is Marhab. And he's talking about himself. He's, he, he, uh, warriors would, would use poetry to kind of boost their confidence. So what would he say, Sayyidina? I'm the one who was called by his mother, the lion. And then he says the very famous pieces of poetry that maybe we'll share one day here. It needs to be sung out to be, to be nice. But he would use the الَّذِي سَمَّتْنِي أُمِّي حَيْدَرَ And this is why when you hear that Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu is, is described as that, it comes from that day. I was the one who was called by his, uh, by his mother, the lion. And they, and they would duel. And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu would actually win the duel. So they would send out someone else. Also a, 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 very, a very tall gentleman. This time Sayyidina, Ali, Sayyidina Zubayr would come running and say, no Ali, this is my, this is my turn. So his mother, who's, who's Sayyidina Zubayr's mother? Anyone know? No, not Asma. Asma is his wife. His mother. Who is he to the Prophet? Zubayr, who is he to the Prophet? He's Ibn huh? he's his, he's his maternal aunt's cousin. So his mother is Safiya, with Abdul Muttalib, right? So Safiya, who's with the Prophet والسلام, during this battle, تقول, يا رسول الله, أعد إلي ولدي. Call him back. Call him back. Look at him. Look at, his, look at the guy he's going to duel with. He's, he's three times his. Like, send, send my son back. Send my son back. For the Prophet والسلام, would say, لا والله. You know, he'd leave him. إن لكل نبي حواري. 
أو حواريا وحواريا الزبير. Every prophet has a disciple, someone who will always have, always is always in his corner, someone who will always stand by him. And mine is your son is Zubair, so leave him alone. So Zayd Zubair would go and he would duel with the next person and he would win it as well. By then the morale on the other side is completely destroyed. They heard the name of Sayyidina Ali, the two strongest warriors are fallen, people are, are panicking, so Sayyidina Ali anhu, would command the army to charge the doors. The doors were huge. You're talking about doors that are a couple of maybe 10 meters uh, tall by maybe 20 meters uh, in, 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 um, in, in the other dimension. And they would charge the doors and they would bring them down. And the, a, a war that would stay for no, for no longer than maybe two, two or three hours and then it would end. 96 people in total would pass away, 16 Muslims and 80 from the, uh, from the other side, and that would be the end of it. And every other, once that first castle fell, the other fat castles, they just fell through the effect of fear. No fights were needed. Every time they came to the doors of one castle, they would panic on the inside. Within a few hours, they would come out surrendering. And all eight castles would be actually uh, conquered and, and would fall uh, with, with the leadership of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu wa arda. I have two things to add during this story. After they conquered the first wall, after they got through the first door, and now you have a lot of land, and then you have an another set of walls and doors and, and a castle. So going through there, they would come by a, a shepherd. He was a slave. So this shepherd would come by with his sheep, and he would say, what are you guys doing exactly here? So they would say, we are Muslims, and..." So he asked, so what, what, is, what is Muslims? So they explained to him, this is what Islam explains. So after he hears about Islam, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ. They say, Anta Rasulullah, you're the one who is the, you're the leader of this group, you're the Prophet. فقال نعم. فقال, تقولوا أن من يؤمن بك يدخل الجنة. You say those who believe in you and stand by you will enter Jannah. فقال نعم. فقال, ألا إني نتن الريح قبيح المنظر خبيث الثياب مكروه بين الناس Indeed, I, I smell horrible, I have horrible clothing, I am ugly, I come from a bad background, and no one likes me. فهل لي جنة? What about do, يعني, someone like me would, would be able to do that? فقال صلى الله عليه وسلم إن آمنت فإذن And if you believe, إذن يطيب ريحك وتغسل ثيابك ويجمل منظرك ويحبك الناس And if you do and you enter Jannah then your clothing will be clean and your odor will be beautiful and your physical appearance will be beautiful and people will love you فقال يكون لي ذلك إن آمنت بك This is what I get if I believe in you فقال نعم فقال أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأنك عبده ورسوله ما أصنع بهذا الغنم. So I, I bear witness in, in the oneness of Allah and in your prophecy. What do I do with this غنم? I have all this sheep. قال أعده إليهم. Give it back to whoever owns it. So he gave it back. يقول فما كان يعني بعد الباب after they got into the second door إلا وقع شهيدا. He, he fell and he died as a martyr that day. يقول صلى الله عليه وسلم قال دخل الجنة ولم يسجد لله سجدة. He entered Jannah and he never prostrated to Allah once. He never prayed once, not even one salah. But he entered Jannah. I see him now. And I see him in Jannah and he's wearing beautiful clothing and he smells nice and he looks good. And the, and the people in Jannah is why they love him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This story to me has always been something that I, I think about this story quite often. And the reason I think about it is the following. The fact that you'll run sometimes in life, you'll come by people who just life has beaten the, just beaten, beaten any hope out of them. They have, been, they have been persecuted and oppressed and mistreated all their, their entire life to the point where they don't feel that they can ever amount to anything that has value to it. The people, that happens, where you're just so oppressed and mistreated, and everyone, everyone you come by has, always speaks negatively to you, and looks at you in a bad way. Some people will come to a point where they just don't feel that they have any value or worth at all. And someone like that would come by the Prophet 
would find enough safety in his presence to express that feeling. Because no one wants to say that. If you feel like that, you don't say it to people because it's very hard to admit it if that's how you feel. But for this gentleman to come to the Prophet ﷺ, to meet Muhammad Rasulullah and to feel safe right away after meeting him, to tell him, I feel like I have no worth at all. Nothing about me is good. I don't like me. I don't like myself. I, how, how could I be someone who would amount to Jannah? And for the Prophet ﷺ, to tell him, no, no, you are of value. And if you do the right thing, you will find that value. And for that to happen to him is just a beautiful story of, 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 of success in this world. That, that's what this is about. Islam is about taking people from their struggle, from the dhulumat, from that darkness, to nur, to enlightenment. And if Islam is not doing that, if it's not, then whoever is doing it is doing it wrong. Whoever is practicing it, preaching it, teaching it, spreading it, bringing people to it, is not doing it right. If it's not taking people from their darkest moments, from their dhulumat, that's what the Quran says, from the dhulumat, dhulumat, ba'duha fawqabal, idha akhraja yadahu lam yakad yaraha. It's like one layer of darkness over the other where you can't see your hand, it's so dark. If Islam is not taking someone like that and allowing them to emerge into light, into nur, where they feel value and they see hope and they know that things will get better for themselves, then I don't know what we're doing. Honestly, I don't know what we're doing. I don't understand the purpose of anything that's being done, if that's not the, if that's not the goal. Because he did that alayhi salatu with this, with this gentleman. And the Prophet alayhi told him, he entered Jannah and he never prostrated. Not once. He was in awe. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. He didn't need, he wasn't required to do any of it. He accepted Islam. He immediately stood by us and he died. And he didn't need to do any of it. And he, this person, yes, he died. He lost his life. But, but the concept, this person believed in himself for a moment. For those moments before he died, this young gentleman felt of worthy. Felt he had worth now. Felt that he, his life mattered. And that he was of importance. And gave up what he was in and was willing to go and do something that was... He was willing to put his life on the line for something. It's, a, it's an amazing... It's a huge... That's a big deal. To feel so committed, so... To feel belong... You belong to something. The point where you're willing to put your life right on the line, right then and there. It's just an overwhelming thought. I don't know if we even have. Honestly, I don't even know if we do. I don't know. I hope. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted us. I don't know if we do. But... I, he was able to instill that with just a moment of interaction to bring that out of somebody. He brought the best out of this gentleman. Yes, he passed away, but he brought, he brought all the courage, all the beauty, all the strength, all the commitment out of him with one session. There was a Bedouin man who had went with him for Khaybar. And at the end of it, after they had conquered the, uh, the, uh, the castles, or before they conquered all of them, but maybe towards the end, because after they went through three or four, a lot of bounty. The Muslims, there's a lot of food there. They were able to eat. Things were getting better. So he was given, here, here's your nasib. Here's some food. So he throws it away. And he comes to the Prophet ﷺ. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't agree to you with this, on this. I agreed with you that I would die fi and, and, and an arrow would enter right through here. That's what we agreed to. Okay. That, un understandable. At the end of the battle, right when it was over, the Prophet ﷺ asked, what, what, what came of the, uh, of the Arabi? The, the, the Arabi that came and wasn't happy that we gave him a little bit of bounty and was, was fighting that he wasn't a martyr. So they had to look for him because they didn't find him. So they found him right before the eighth castle, right before they conquered the last one. He's on the ground. And, and he had an arrow that went right through his throat. فَقَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَجَدْنَاهُ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ If I'm on the ground with an arrow going through here, coming through here. فَقَالَ صلى الله عليه وسلم أَهُوَ هُوَ Is it actually him, the same guy? The same guy who talked to you, asked for it? Even the Prophet ﷺ was The same guy, فَقَالُوا نَعَمْ It's the same guy. فَقَالَ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ فَصَدَقَهُ اللَّهُ صَدَقَ اللَّهَ فَصَدَقَهُ اللَّهُ Meaning, he was honest and, and sincere. He was truthful to Allah, so Allah was truthful to him. He was sincere towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with what he wanted, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivered it for him with the same level of, level of sincerity. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a bit, yani, as Muslims, we don't celebrate death. N nothing I'm telling you here is trying to celebrate death, ever. I've, I've said this many times, but I feel sometimes I have to remind people. The point of these stories is not to celebrate someone dying. It's to remind you of the importance of having enough sincerity 
enough commitment that you're willing to put your life on the line for something. Because that anything less than that, fi sabilillah, is not really is not really a commitment or belief. We're not required as Muslims today. Like nothing that you are for the for the majority of people here, inshallah ta'ala, and probably for the rest of your life. As a Muslim, your your commitment and your dedication will not involve war, won't involve fighting and dying. It will involve something different. It will involve a commitment of time, a commitment of wealth, a commitment of learning, of training, of community service. That's what's going to be needed from you, from a knowledge spreading and learning for yourself. But when we study these stories and we see someone who was willing to give his life and gave his life, it reminds us of, of how simple our sacrifices. If you're not willing to give time, I guarantee you won't give your life. Huh? I guarantee it. I am willing to, you know, if I, I'm not a betting man and it's haram to bet, but I would put all my money on the fact that you will not give your life if you can't give a couple of hours. If you're not able to educate yourself on Islamic law, and you're not willing to spread the, the deen, you're not willing to commit yourself to community service, something, just a bit of time, you're not willing to do that? In a moment like that, you wouldn't be like this. I'm sorry, I don't mean to use this terminology that's, that, that can be offensive. It's not, I'm not trying to be offensive. But if we're not able to commit ourselves with the time that we have, in the safety of our environment, where we just, all you're required to do is educate yourself, help educate others, help serve, see where there are needs, support people, aid them, help us, help us thrive as a community, as an ummah. If you're not willing to do that, and it's just an issue of time and knowledge and wealth, then you think you're willing to give your life What's the most valuable thing in this world to you? Your life. Your life. Please don't come to this realization late. Please. Please don't realize that too late. Nothing matters more than being alive. Your health and being able to breathe. I can tell you that because people who work all their lives to build an empire of wealth and networking, then they get sick. See, that's what I, that's the, that's what I do. I, I'm forced to, I have to repeat this to you because I see this every day. This is, a part of my, this is a part of my daily practice. I have to see people who are coming in, who are willing, who are willing to give anything, everything, if they, could just, if they could just live longer, just a little bit longer. If I could just tell them that they're not going to be dead in six months. If I could just look at them in the face and be honest and tell them that it's not a year or a year and a half that's left in your life. And they're willing to give up everything. What, what, you're talking copious amounts of money, amounts of wealth that my little brain can't even understand. I've never seen so much money in a place. I've never seen a bank account with a number like that. But sometimes you can't buy that. Sometimes you can't buy life. Huh? You can buy a lot of things. You can't buy an extension to the time that you have on this planet. You can't. You can try. You can't, though. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is he's destined to all of us for a certain time, and it'll be, and you can't. Nothing is more valuable than being alive. When we talk about people like this who, who are willing to put their life, no, I want, I, I'm not afraid. I know what's waiting, I'm not afraid, I'm willing to give my life. That's a plausible. That's plausible because, because that's real. That's real. It's all fun and games. It's all talk until your life is on the line. It's all talk. I cannot emphasize that enough. It's all, they put their lives on the line, they were willing to do that. I'm saying, we're not, we're not none of us are required to do that. Just, yeah, Sheikh, just put a little bit of time. You can't, you can't put some time. You can't learn your deen a little bit. You can't spend some time teaching someone who would require it. You have no expertise in this world that you can offer someone, no skill set that someone can benefit from. You have no interest in contributing or serving, nothing. You have nothing. You're that busy. That's how busy. You have no time at all. You can't come for salawat. You can't bring your children. You can't see someone who maybe cannot commute and maybe bring them with you. Not nothing. You're that busy. People are willing to give their lives and you have no time, nothing? I don't believe in that in life. I believe that we just have priority lists. And then you just take something, you put it low enough on the priority list, so there's no time allocated for it. Or it's just extra time. If I have an extra time, I'll come. But if I don't, I'm not talking about these halaqat. These halaqat are just open stuff. You can come. I'm talking about actually figuring out where your piece of the puzzle fits. What are you going to do? How are you going to improve the status of this ummah? How are you going to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You weren't there for khaybah. You can't go back in time and be there and stand with him. What are you going to do now? What? There's no need for you to fight. There's no need for you to give your life. What else do you have? I don't want your life. What else do I got? What else do you got? You have time? You have knowledge? You have expertise? You have skill sets? You have wealth? Put that. Put that. It's, it's cheaper. Wallahi, it's cheaper. Wallahi, it's easier. It's easier. You think it's, it's more difficult to be asked to give your life? No. 
It's much easier, but we're not willing to do that. And that's the problem. That's the problem. We're not willing. We don't have that commitment. I was asked this question earlier. What is the biggest, during the town hall, what's the biggest challenge here? It's commitment. It's finding people who are committed. Committed till the end. To the bitter end. To have the grit to do it till the end. When you work with communities, it's very hard. It's a lot of discouragement. It's a lot of disappointment. It's very frustrating. There's a lot of problems. No one thanks you properly. and You're always being scrutinized for every small mistake that you make. That is the reality of working in community service. But if you truly do it for the sake of Allah, none of that matters. And none of that will discourage you. None of that will hold you back. If your vision is clear, if you know why you're doing what you're doing, you'll continue to do it until you meet God himself. And that's what's missing. We have people who have a burst of energy that maybe carries them for a few months and then they fizzles out and they die off. I've been doing this for a long time, so I see people come in, then leave. Try to hold on to them, but then they leave again. Commitment and dedication is what we require. Do that. If you are capable of saying, no, no, I am, I am in this for the long haul. I am in the, I'm, I'm going to continue to advocate for the health and the wellness of the Muslim Ummah until the last breath in my life. I will continue to find a way to contribute. And no matter how much I'm pushed away or how many times I'm frustrated or removed, or I will find a way to contribute again because I'm not doing it for people. I'm not doing it for, I'm doing it because this is the ahad I have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I couldn't be there that day. Because I didn't stand with Ali when he broke down that door. I wasn't able to stand and support the Prophet alayhi salatu when he needed me. But he needs you now and he can do it now too. And that's the end of my rant on that story. Khaybar falls and a treaty is signed. All of Khaybar completely falls. All of this, it's really weird. Any of those castles could have easily outstood the Prophet the Muslims in terms of time. They never needed to actually, they didn't, the Muslims didn't have any, any ways to, they didn't have anything. They didn't have the tools to actually conquer. It's just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stays here and they were able to do it. They got through to the last castle and then they signed the treaty. The treaty was that they would put down their, their arms, no more arms. I mean, the Muslims would take all of the swords, all of the, they had catapults, all that would be taken away. They would continue to live there, and the Muslims, and they would, there would be taxation of them, which is equal to the zakat that the Muslims are paying. They would pay taxation, uh, taxes to the Muslim uh, country, just like the Muslims pay zakat, and then and there would be no more conspiracies. So many of the people of Khaybar left, Many of them, after this uh, treaty, like, no, we don't want to be here anymore, they left. And those who didn't want to leave stayed, and they owned their lands. The Prophet Islam didn't claim their lands. Didn't take it away from them. No, no, you can, this is your land, you work it. But you owe what the Muslims owe in terms of, uh, of zakah. You owe it as taxation, and, and, and they paid it. I have, I have three, three stories to add uh, on this that happened right after Khaybar. The preachers or, the, or the, um, the religious leaders of the community of Khaybar wanted to leave. They didn't want to stay there anymore. So they did, but then they noticed that they had missed or left behind in their synagogues. They had left some of the Torah. So they came, they came and they claimed it from the Prophet and the Muslims. And the Muslims and the Prophet gathered the scriptures that they, that, they didn't, that they didn't take and they gave it to them to take with them. Compare that to what happened when other armies conquered other parts of the world. All you have to do is go compare what happened when other armies from other faiths conquered other parts of the world and how they burnt all scripture and they burnt not just all scripture but they sometimes burnt every intellectual output that existed all the books they burnt everything the prophet والسلام, gathered the scripture and handed it over to them and gave it to them and this is what he taught Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab to do which is what Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab did once he went made it to the holy land which is what Salah al-Din Ayyubi did years later when he did the same and this is what we're committed to as Muslims we don't burn knowledge we don't burn books and we don't deny people their right to believe in whatever they want to believe in and to have their holy uh, spaces and to have their holy uh, scriptures and to have the right to practice their religion. Do what you want as long as I have the right to practice mine. You're welcome to do whatever you want. I will continue to perform da'wah. I will continue to try to explain what is correct for you so that you can find the light in what I'm doing. But if you choose not to, then that's, your, that's up to you. And it won't be something that I, I have no right and have no interest in forcing you to do anything. He would marry, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, Safiya bint Huyay ibn Akhtab. This is one of the most interesting marriages that we have within the Prophet alayhi wa sallam's life. He married Safiya. Her father was Huyay ibn Akhtab. 
If you've been listening for the last maybe uh, three months of the Seerah Halaqa, his name comes up every time. Huyay ibn Akhtab is the one who conspired on the day of Ahzab. He is the one who conspired. Huyay ibn Akhtab was one of the leaders of, 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 of Khaybar at the time who continued to conspire against Muslims all his life until he, until he met his demise. He married, sallallahu alayhi wa his daughter, Safiya. This was an act of unity. It was a, symb it was a symbolic act that the Prophet, والسلام, did not see a specific race of people or a specific religious background to be people who are lesser or are not worthy of, of union. So he married Safiya to bring, to bring people together. Safiya would accept Islam and she would be one of the most pious of his wives. And once Aisha and, and Hafsa would say something about her, they would mock her because she's, uh, you know, because she's short. Or they mocked her once because he's like, well, the Prophet ﷺ doesn't necessarily you know, love you. They would say something you know, about her to try and belittle her. Things happen. So she came to the Prophet ﷺ upset. فَقَالَ لَهَا عَلَيْهِ عَلَيْهِمْ Go back and tell them. فَقُولِي أَنَا زَوْجِي نَبِي وَأَبِي نَبِي وَعَمِّي نَبِي Go back and say, my husband is a prophet, Muhammad sallallahu and my father is a prophet, Musa alayhi salam, and my uncle is a prophet, Harun alayhi salam. فَأَيُّكُمْ لِلْأَنْبِيَاءِ أَقْرَبْ مِنِّي Which of you has more attachment to prophets more than me? قَالَ فَغَلَبَتْهُنَّ And she beat them with that, uh, with that, with that argument, رضي الله عنه, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam provided her. In his life, they attempted to kill him over nine times, alayhi salatu wasalam. Imagine that, imagine a figure where his... There were nine attempts of assassination on him, alayhi salatu wasalam. This is one of them. This one actually mattered. The other ones didn't have much of an effect. This one did. After they, the Prophet wasalam, signed the treaty, a lot of the people of Khaybar stayed in Khaybar. So the Prophet alayhi salatu was asked, was invited over for a, for a feast. So he went, alayhi salatu. He, he responded to the, to the uh, gathering. He went. So they gave him food. Before he ate, before he swallowed a piece of... Uh, of, of, the, of the lamb, Jibreel would come quickly and tell him, uh, spit it out. D -d -d Don't swallow it. It's poisoned. So he would take a bite and he would spit it out and he would say, إِنِّي سَائِلُكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَإِنْ صَدَقْتُمُونِي كَانَ وَإِلَّمْ تَصْدُقُونِي أَخْرَجْتُكُمْ If you tell me the truth, I will let things be. And if you don't tell me the truth, then I will, يعني, I will remove you. أَوَضَعْتُمْ فِيهَا السُّمْ Is there poison in this? فَخَافَتِ الْمَرْأَ The lady who had, had, had Cooked it, got scared. فقالت, نعم, we asked which piece of the lamb you liked the most, so he put a lot of, uh, a lot of poison in it. Now the problem is the Prophet ﷺ, so he did that. ﷺ, they had put, they put, of course, يعني, uh, poison everywhere, but they put a lot of it in the, in the piece that he liked. And he forgave her. He didn't hold her accountable for it. But he would say, دَخَلَ فِيَّ شَيْءٌ مِّنَ السُّمْ A little bit of it went, went, went in. So when he came to die, which I'll tell you later in a couple of months, فَقَالَ آنَ أَوَانُ إِنْقِطَاعَ أَبْهُرِي مِنْ ذَلِكَ السُّمْ The time has come for the effect of that poison to fully take, take my life. And the reason that he said that, alayhi salatu wasalam, I think, wallahu alam, is that his death was also, there was martyrism in his death, alayhi salatu wasalam. It took years, but the effect of the poison, because he felt it, alayhi salatu wasalam, he felt the pain. And he forgave the lady, but then, because they had poisoned the whole thing, one of the Sahaba had ate a full piece and died. Once he died, he removed them. Once the man passed, was, died, the Prophet ﷺ asked the family, Khalas, you're, you're out of Khaybar, you're not allowed. And he did not kill the lady, ﷺ. His goal was not to make things worse. He, wasn't, he was trying not to, he paid the diya for, to, to the family of the Sahabi who passed away, and he removed the family that, uh, that, that put in the poison, and he refused to execute her. Alayhi salatu wasalam, because he didn't want to make things worse. He was trying, alayhi salatu wasalam, to extend an olive branch to his enemies. But that's why he ended up dying, sallallahu alayhi wasalam. Was, it was the effect of the, of, the, uh, of the poison that he had in that piece of meat that he ate initially. But he didn't go through the whole thing, so he didn't die, alayhi salatu wasalam. What's left of the story, yeah, and he, honestly speaking, or kind of, is the reclaiming of, of, of the Holy Land, the reclaiming of Mecca. And, and the Battle of Hunayn, and that's pretty much kind of, and it goes with Tabuk, and that's it. So there's three more basic stories to tell, and it will be done. I don't think we'll finish before Ramadan, we'll probably finish right after Ramadan. But definitely this piece here is very sentimental. When you talk about reclaiming Mecca, you're talking about the Prophet ﷺ's 20-year struggle with his own people, with his own family, with the people of, of the Holy Land of Mecca. 
Finally, the Prophet ﷺ, after neutralizing Khaybar, no, the, the treaty is signed, there's no problems anymore. He wanted to find a way to take Mecca peacefully. He didn't want to march, he didn't want to go in and cause a fight. He didn't want there to be war. He didn't want, he didn't want there to be bloodshed on that day. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the, 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 uh, the, the, the permission to enter Mecca uh, with an army. But he didn't want there to be bloodshed. So the Prophet ﷺ would spend some time actually yeah, and he's planning this out, and I'll show you what's going to happen. I'll tell you the beginning of the story, and then I'll let the Kahoot, inshallah, happen. Three events led up to the claim, reclaiming of Mecca. Three things. Hudaybiyah, co the correspondence with the kings, and Khaybar. After those three things, Quraysh was completely helpless. After Hudaybiyah, after the treaty that recognized the Muslims as a country, after he corresponded with the kings, so he became an international figure, and after Khaybar was neutralized, so there's no more fear over there, Quraysh had nothing left. Quraysh was bankrupt. They knew they had lost the war. They won a few battles, but they lost the war. They didn't have anything. They had nothing to offer. And the Prophet ﷺ had the military ability to march right down to Mecca and take it anytime he wanted. But he wasn't ready to do that yet, ﷺ. The story, um, the story that actually occurs in order for, this, uh, for, for the reclaiming of Mecca to happen, it begins with two tribes. Now, if you remember Hudaybiyah, the treaty was that anyone who wanted to enter the alliance of the Prophet and the Muslims could do it. Anyone who wanted to enter into the alliance of Quraysh could do that. So Khuza'a entered to the alliance of the Prophet ﷺ. They didn't all accept Islam. Uh, most of them didn't. Most of Khuza'a were not Muslim. But they entered into the alliance of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So the Prophet had allies who were not Muslim. Bakr entered the alliance of Quraysh. Bakr and Khuza'a hate each other. They're two tribes that have a lot of history. A lot of history. So what happened was, Khuza'a was going for Umrah. They were unarmed and going for Umrah because the treaty in the land would allow that. So they go for Umrah. Bakr was waiting. They wait until they come to a, a, like a, a place a, a way on, just before they enter Mecca where they drink water. It's like, it's like a place called Al-Watir. And they would uh, sta stay that night to fill up their, uh, their water to go for Umrah. And they would come and they would start slaughtering them. And they would kill 20 men from Khuza'a. Khuza'a would take refuge in the Haram. They would run right into the Kaaba to take refuge. But Bakr are coming behind them with their swords. So their leader of Bakr, the name was Nawfal ibn Mu'ayyah over there. As he's entering with his sword into the Haram, behind the people of Khuza'a, obviously in the Haram you're not allowed to kill anything. You're not allowed to kill an ant. So the people, his, his own tribe say, Ya Nawfal, taqtulu fil Haram. Nawfal, we're going to kill someone in the Haram. So Nawfal turns to them and he says this, and I'm going to leave you with this because this is, I'm going to unpack this next week. You guys, you guys, you guys steal in the haram all the time. Huh? You, you can't, you, you, you're, you're, you're going to draw the line at, at killing. You, you guys are thieves in the haram day and night. You're not going to kill you? It's fine. Beware of the little sins that you think are useless and worthless and not important. Beware. It's from that door that shaitan enters and he just, he just makes the orifice bigger. Small sins that you think don't mean anything. Smallest things that you don't think matter. It's through the door of those small sins that Shaytan finds his way in and ruins whatever ethics you have left. They stole in the haram. They would do some shoplifts, um, you know, pocket picking, something like that. They did it long enough. The moment came when they should have had enough integrity to say, no, no, we don't kill in the haram. And they said, ah, you guys steal in the haram. You know, what's the difference between stealing and killing? And they, and they butchered the people of Khuza'a in the haram. They, one person would make it over to Abu Dayl ibn Warqa, the leader of Khuza'a, and, tell, and told him this would happen. So he would send a man by the name of Amr ibn Salim on horseback towards the Prophet والسلام, And that's where the story begins, and I'll tell you that inshallah next week. There will be a kahoot inshallah for the next few minutes, so please uh, for the, uh, take out your phones uh, and, and participate. Inshallah, Zakum al-Khair. We'll see you inshallah in the next week. All right, Assalamu Alaikum, everyone. Inshallah, the Kahoot, the pin for the Kahoot is 4729801. Inshallah, there will be three winners again this week as well. Um, so I'll see the pin again. It's 4729801. That's the yelling to the mic. Also, I ask if you're not going to participate, please sit down or step outside so people can see the screen, please.
If you guys don't want to participate, please sit down or step outside so people can see the screen, inshallah. Right, I'll say the game pin again. So it's 472-9801. Alright, inshallah. Can you, I ask everyone to put your real name as well so I know who the winners are. And like I said, please, if you're not going to participate, please take a seat or step outside so people can see the screen, please. All right, well, I'll give you like one more minute. And the game pin is 472-9801. We'll start in like 30 more seconds. All right. All right, 10 more seconds and we'll get started, inshallah. All right, 472-9801 is the pin code. And we'll start in like, we'll, we'll get started. All right, can we hit start? Start. You also go slow in the questions because that's a curveball. All right, question number one. So all these questions are going to be about the Battle of Khaybar, inshallah, all right? It's about the Battle of Khaybar from last week. All right, so question number one. Was the Battle of Khaybar before or after Hijrah? We'll start off pretty easy here. Was it before or after? And you got 10 more seconds. Was the battle before or after Hijrah? All right, and the answer is, it was after, yeah. So the battle was after Hijrah. So question number two. All right, question, oh, I see the leaderboard first. No, H and I is in first. All right, whatever. All right, question number two. What year did, after Hijrah did it take place? So we know it was after Hijrah. What year after Hijrah was it though? Was it five, six, seven, or eight? And you got 10 more seconds. Also remember, the faster you answer, the more points you get. And the higher you climb up on the, on the leaderboard. All right. And the answer is, it was seven. Yep. So the Battle of Khaybar was seven years after Hijrah. All right. And H and I still in first, Western Eng second, and SM is in third. All right. Hit next. Yes, sweet. All right, how many people died in the battle? How many people died in the battle of Khaybar? All right, it was 85, 112, 92, or 96. All right, so people are thinking here. This was a tricky one. How many people died? You got five more seconds. All right, and the answer was? It was 96. All righty, all righty. We're halfway there. Oh, Western Engine first, SM second, MWN VIP is in third. That's fine. That's where you get the question now. All right. True or false? Did the Prophet wanted the army to be scattered? So when they were entering into Khaybar, did the Prophet want the army to be scattered in different spots? Or did he want it to go in all together? That's true or false? All right. Three more seconds. And the answer was false. Yeah. The Prophet told them to all stay together so they can enter together because they did not know what was coming ahead. And that brings us to the next leaderboard here. Western Eng still in first. All right. Pretty close. Pretty close. All right. Question number five. What is the right description of Khaybar? Now think closely. Look at the options. Read carefully and then answer. What is the description of Khaybar? How many trees? How many warriors? And how many castles were there in Khaybar? All right, you got five more seconds. Three, two, one. All right, it was 40,000 trees, 10,000 warriors, and eight castles. All right, I see the leaderboard now. It might have changed. All right, Zainab part three in first, Ahmed, Ahmed in second, and Western Edge in third. All right, all right. Now, all right, now listen carefully. 
I made this Kahoot and I put a curveball in here. Next question, you have five seconds to answer and it's double the points. So the leaderboard can change. It's double the points, you have five seconds. So be quick. All right, and the question is, and it's also double points, who was the one person that left the group? The prophet wanted them to be scat or to be um, together. One person left the group. All right, yeah. All right, that's, that was a trick question. It was a curveball, but I'll see the leaderboard. All right, I'm sure it changed now. Let's see the leaderboard. Number three, Ahmed. Number three. Number second, Zena. Part two, and number first. All right, number first is AR. All right, congratulations to all three winners. Um, if you can come up and claim your prizes afterwards. And inshallah, one last announcement. If we're looking for five to 10 people to stay afterwards and help with the, cle or with the cleanup. So if you're available to volunteer and help clean up, please stay inside and we will use your help. Thank you very much. Zakam al-Khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.